Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be the moderator for a panel such as this. And a subject that has been selected is beyond the university. Many of us have actually been through rather traditional universities. We have siblings, friends, parents who have also gone through such situations. But it's time now to think of what happens with the higher education that we have got. And uh, the way this uh, session has been framed, it's about the ongoing debates on curriculum change in higher education. And for a long time, this has been going back and forth, and there's been a tinkering of the curriculum, but no substantial change seems to be possible until recently. There's also been the specific debate on whether to make STEM the basis of higher education, and that is science, technology, engineering, and maths. And having done that in some of the universities that were bold enough to take that up as a priority, there is now the realization that the arts and the humanities are missing from the STEM curriculum and the STEM way of imparting higher education. So from STEM, we have now moved to STEAM, inserting that A, which stands for the arts with a capital A. So what we are looking at is the relationship between higher education and development. We're questioning whether the curriculum is actually leading to any kind of social change that is positive. We are wondering if the students who graduate from these universities are employable, are they entrepreneurs, are they contributing to the development of the country, whatever that country might be. And these are some of the issues that are going to come up with the panelists that we have today. So I'm... Um, I'm going to start with Dipankar, whose work I read very often, and I'm sure many of you do, Home Ground, India. So I'm going to just maybe pose a question or two to you, Dipankar. And um, you've been writing very regularly for the newspapers and some very hard-hitting articles. Um, not so long ago, Dipankar Gupta wrote an article which had the headline, Look Ahead and Not Back. As India completes 70 years of independence, time to trash the blame game, says Dipankar. This is the, in August, very close to a very important day in the Indian calendar. So there is this legacy of colonial education that we have. So when you say, let's trash the, the blame games, let's do something different, what is it that you have in mind? Well, you see, as long as we uh, keep blaming the colonial rulers for what has happened to us, we'll really never shake ourselves off and you know, do things on our own. And Jawaharlal Nehru in his book, Discovery of India, said that when a nation goes through a crisis, it gets better and younger. That he was emphasizing that, the kind of a revitalization takes place, a renaissance of sorts. And we should, I think, do the same thing as other countries did, such as China and Russia, according to Nehru. And that is how they grew and, and, and became stronger. Instead, very often what we spend most of our time is that in, in complaining that what we are saddled with is a, a, a gift from the colonialists which you can't get rid of, which is, I think, a very poor and lame excuse. You have all this time to do something, but you haven't really done very much. One of the things that the British left us with is a legacy of no research. In universities, research is not done, and the British do not really encourage it in India. They encourage it a lot in their own country, of course, but not in India, because they thought education in India was uh, enough to, to produce pen pushers. But when we became independent, we really didn't put much emphasis on research either. I mean, there's no point in setting up certain institutes of higher excellence, the islands of excellence, if those are not fed constantly by other institutes around the country. So we have... IITs and IIMs and so forth, and though they are just starving out there because there isn't enough live blood flowing the system, and that can only happen through research. I know in universities, when the parliamentarians sit down to look at our universities, they rarely ever ask the question, what kind of research is going on? They want to know how many MAs there are and MPhils and PhDs, how many teachers and how many hours you spend on the blackboard, but research is not really on the agenda. So I would say if you want to break free from the British uh, kind of stranglehold what they left us, the first thing we should do is to emphasize research across the board, everywhere. To say that uh, humanities haven't really got much purchase in our country is really not saying much because what have the humanities done so far? 
They haven't really contributed a lot. And it's about time they did. And they haven't contributed a lot because there hasn't been much research and there isn't that drive from inside. Because there's no encouragement. People get all kinds of jobs and, and, and positions because of political connections. Well, that's uh, raising a very important area of thought that uh, money must go into research. Now, we all know that research is very uh, expensive. And uh, Dipankar, you have another um, essay which is called Education and Citizenship Beyond the Rights-Based Approach. So I want to ask you, if you're looking at right-based approach, then education has a democratic principle and it must reach out to everybody. Now, the moment it spreads so thinly across the country and everybody has a right to education, where is the funding for research? And given the conditions in which we are in a democratic nation, where a lot of the higher education is subsidized, uh, where are we going to find that funding for research? Though at the same time, I agree with you that unless there's a research edge to education, how are we going to contribute to problem solving in the country, for instance? How are we going to make the education relevant to everyday issues in the country and do bring about a kind of a social good? So how would you see this balance between the need for sponsoring research and the right to education? Well, first and foremost, let me say this much, uh, step by step. The first thing is that I don't believe in the right to education because <clears throat> The right to education takes the government off the hook. I would rather have a policy on education. With the right to education, what really happens is you have a very inferior school, poor system of ed education, and you complain to the government, they say, there's your school, go there. The schools are not worth it. Why is it that 70% of children in India, you know, they go to, they go to, to, to uh, in, uh, hospitals which uh, are private. 35% go to private schools. Why is that the case? Because the kind of service they get in the educational health system is just not at par. So the point really is that you must give them better educational uh, services and institutions, and it is not good enough to say that we don't have the money. In fact, there is a lot of money lying around, is how we use the money. As I tell those who make this complaint, that if tomorrow you were to be attacked on the borders, would you say we don't have the money, let's surrender? Of course not. Education and health are equal emergencies, and you should find the money. Not just that. I can rattle off names of all these Western European countries and Canada, for example, where they started on these programs of education and health when they did not have the money, when they were not at the richest. They became rich much later. Britain was so poor it couldn't handle India. Bas Spain was so poor that it just had a huge unemployment deficit. And yet they went into it because they thought this was the right thing to do. And if you think it's the right thing to do, you have to think backwards. You can't say we are poor, therefore we'll give poor education. Remember, if you have a targeted education system that says education for the poor, if you have a target health system which says health for the poor, believe me, you'll end up with poor education and poor health. There's no other way. So I would say one should forget about right to education because if you find a child outside loitering about kicking stones or whistling around, what will you do? Why isn't he in school? Who will you hold responsible? His parents, the district magistrate, the principal, you don't know. But if you have a policy on education, then you can do something about it. The rights language has to be moderated. It's very UN speak. And I think that that's where we go wrong. Well, that's, that's a very strong statement and I can see it felt from the heart. Um, I'm going to hold that in abeyance and come back to it a little later. Because I want to turn to Matt Reed and the Aga Khan Foundation, which you are heading. Now, this is a foundation which has been looking into community-driven solutions and development changes, and also creating higher education institutions across the world, mm -hmm. not in India yet, but in many other countries. There is also this vision of a Central Asian University, which is a consortium of many countries putting together their resources. And although in Delhi we know the Aga Khan Foundation for the Humayu's Tomb Restoration, of course, and in a way that's public education, yep. I want to ask you about the involvement of the Aga Khan Foundation in this global network of uh, higher education, new curriculum, and curriculum that is directly linked to development issues. What is the vision and how do you think it is implemented? Well, thanks very much. I mean, I think I want to 
echo this comment about education being an emergency. I think that from our perspective as a development network, we feel a sense of urgency about development. And for us, that means a sense of urgency about education. So we have 10 agencies, uh, development agencies in the network. Five of those agencies are devoted to education at various levels. So uh, whether it's uh, early childhood and primary, secondary, or universities. So two of those uh, uh, agencies are universities. So uh, it gives you a sense of, of why education is fundamental to us. I think the other reason is because if you think about it, back to your point, um, development really is, a, for us, about creating adaptability and resilience. And so education has to be at the base of that. And so when you look at trying to create an education system, whether it's right-based or you're looking at it from a policy base, you're trying to find a way to have a balanced portfolio of educational investments that are gonna make the country as a whole more resilient. And so what we've tried to do in the places where we're present is focus, along with the international community, on basic education, that's fundamental, but on the other hand, you need some high quality institutions that can help you set benchmarks and standards, mm -hmm. that can make a really strong claim for doing research that is um, relevant to those local contexts. So what we've done in the places where we have uh, helped form universities, so uh, that's Aga Khan University, which is in five countries, the University of Central Asia, which is a public-private partnership uh, in three countries of Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. What we've tried to do in these institutions is make sure that they are very linked to the needs of those places. So rather than sort of starting with an inherited curriculum, starting with the system that they already have, because all of those places have systems that they inherited. I mean, in the place, if you look at a place like Central Asia, you're talking about a system inherited from the Soviet Union that is now trying to adapt itself to a totally new situation. And so what we've tried to do is take a step back look at the country, engage with not only its leadership but with its peoples to understand what is it that a university education ought to be providing. And I think what you find in a place like that in particular, although you could uh, make a similar argument about India or, or any other, many other countries, is that creating the foundation, uh, creating, a, a, let's say, a next generation of leaders that are adaptable is absolutely important for a country like that. Uh, for countries like that. If you look at the Central Asia region, you have uh, command and control economies that for a very long time were driven from above, totally dependent, if you will, on Soviet largesse uh, and, and that connectivity. All of a sudden, that goes away. They find themselves in a situation that's open, a bit laissez-faire. They have to make their way in the world. And they have educational systems that actually have not prepared their citizens to work in that world. And so one of the things that we're trying to do through these universities is help teach people how to do that. So at one level, it's about working with students so that they learn skills of critical thinking, open dialogue, creative inquiry, innovation, things that they might not have necessarily got through a Soviet-led system, for example, but things that will allow them to both ask questions of their country and their economy and help it find answers. And then the second thing is to equally make an investment in research that is centered on the kinds of questions that are relevant to those countries. Um, so if you look at the University of Central Asia, uh, you would have a, a broad-based curriculum that's also combined with uh, 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 specializations uh, in things like earth sciences, environmental sciences, uh, communications and media, uh, uh, economics in particular, public policy, these are all areas that are very, very important where a kind of la uh, a lack of high quality research but also high quality talent, if you will, is oftentimes lacking. Well, the, the Aga Khan Foundation uh, believes in strengthening civil society, building strength from within, and so to speak. So from what I understand, that a lot of the talent that is used in the projects and programs is also local people, yep. students, citizens, etc. A very large percentage of the workers, educators are from within the country. Um, and yet, the Aga Khan Foundation is also looking into deprived and marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. So what is the process of education that will create this intellectual capacity within the deprived and marginal communities? Yep. I mean, in a way, I'm linking it 
to what Dipankar is saying, that you yeah. know, where does the, do the new strengths and the new vision come from, yeah. which will be society oriented and development directed? So I think it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, we were talking a moment ago about state funded education. I should be clear, these are private institutions. They don't receive money from the state. Uh, they are supported through a combination of revenues from tuition, from uh, grants from the foundation uh, and His Highness the Aga Khan, uh, and from donor agencies. They really have to make their way in the world and also through doing things that generate revenues. They themselves have to be a bit entrepreneurial. So there's something important about having a private institution that's devoted to these things, but at the same time there's this question about equity and access. So I think it's important to emphasize that even though these are private institutions, they are what we call merit-based and needs-blind. So in other words, if you are capable of getting entry, um, we will admit you, and then we will figure out how to pay for you. So at the University of Central Asia, uh, every student uh, receives financial aid, and most of them receive about 90% of the tuition uh, cost uh, as a scholarship. Uh, at the Aga Khan University, 75% of the students receive financial aid, uh, and it covers about 75% of their costs. Um, that financial aid package can involve loans, et cetera. So the point being is that uh, what you want to do when you're developing these models, if you will, is to find ways to ensure that you can reach out to the most marginalized who are capable uh, and give them that opportunity. Because you know, I think we all know from having spent time, you know, I spend uh, quite a bit of time when I travel around the world in villages. And one of the things that you often realize is that what is lacking sometimes are role models, and what you need are those people who've actually succeeded, right? So that, so that people understand that there's a pathway to success for them. And so through the foundation's work and the work of the network, what we try to do is actually work at every one of those levels so that you could actually have um, a, a plausible pathway to success if you are from a marginalized community, whether it's rural or urban, so that, uh, that you can see that there are examples of students who have gone to high or higher quality primary schools, high, oftentimes state schools, but nonetheless uh, have gone up through that system, same at the secondary level and same at the tertiary level. So one of the things that we really try to do uh, at all levels is to connect those programs to those people. I think the other thing to, 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 to emphasize is that the universities that we're engaging with also have programs that are designed to both improve public institutions, so they are themselves supposed to serve as resources for development, both for, let's say, public educational institutions or public higher education institutions, uh, and in some instances, like at the University of Central Asia, focused on things like uh, vocational and technical development. So that the, the university isn't only for the elite, it isn't only about, uh, let's say, uh, high quality research that's, that uh, isn't focused on uh, the needs of the many. Actually, it's also trying to figure out where are the ways to innovate around things like vocational and professional education that are most relevant to a maximum number of communities and do it in such a way that it makes that education more relevant and makes them more employable. Well, we've had um, two viewpoints, one which is looking at the problematic legacy of colonial education and with the realization that we should chuck the blame game, we don't really know how to take the next pathway. And another viewpoint from the Aga Khan Foundation as to how you can actually visualize a new way of imparting education all the way from the primary level to higher education in corporate research, have a social responsibility which allows the student, the gifted, talented student from deprived backgrounds to develop the confidence to go ahead with education and be fully supported. I'm now going to turn to you, Martin Puckner, from Harvard University. And Harvard is, of course, one of the oldest universities in the US, and uh, by any standards, a very, very well-known, well-regarded, highly respected, place where everybody aspires to be someday, and you're there, you're teaching there in the English department, but uh, as a member of the English department, I can say that your courses are much more innovative than I could have ever done here. So I would like to um, invite you to consider the statements from both our other panelists. Um, where does a university such as Harvard 
take the journey of higher education, keeping in mind the past, the historical baggage in a way of Harvard, and yet keeping in view also the development requirements of employment, et cetera, that new America is in need of. Yeah. So what modifications are possible, envisaged in curriculum developments? What are the sort of changes you have made in your own curriculum? Yeah. Thank you. And you know, I, I'm not sure that Harvard is actually a leader in educational innovation at all, because precisely because it is such a old, and that means tradition-bound university. And so I think we are trying to figure out what everybody is trying to figure out, namely how to create an education for the 21st century. And especially those in the humanities, we are struggling particularly hard. That, that goes back to your, to this, the, the uh, framing discussions about uh, the dominance of engineering and science education right now. One of the paradoxes for me is that I've um, taught a lot of courses and started a program in a kind of arts practice-based program in theater, dance, and media. And it's been much easier, in a sense, to convince engineers that artists, practicing artists, are compatible with them because arts education is a hands-on, it's a practical education that requires certain techniques, that means that you're, you're, you acquire certain, you know, sometimes these are technology, sometimes these are acting techniques or public speaking techniques. And I think that it's easier to convince parents and university administrators that these are transferable skills, that we have a lot of collaborations between artists and engineering students everything having to do with developing new apps to other sort of more fundamental research. What's much harder is to convince parents and university administrators, both at Harvard and elsewhere, of the values of a traditional humanities education. So I think that's, that's much more difficult to translate into our current climate, and it's harder to convince students of that, and I, I don't know that I have a real answer to it. One part of it is I think that we, meet, we need to find a way of teaching humanities that has to do with practice, that you don't just study something, that you also do something, and I think that has to do with incorporating creative writing experiments, that means that a humanities uh, education emphasizes writing in different forms. It's, to some sense, back to the basics, but it's also learning from engineers, learning from the arts practice po programs that I think are springing up in different places, and learning some of these lessons for traditional humanities. What exactly that will look like, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, um... You've actually given some directions, it seems to me, in that wonderful book that's been so well received. And your book is called The Written World, The Power of Stories to Shape People, History, Civilization. A large subject, <laughs> and you have focused on just 16 foundational texts from world literature. And you have talked about the impact of these 16 texts on, in, in the development of ideas in intellectual history. And looking more closely into the book, I found you know, philosophies and concepts very varied. I mean, for instance, you've got 1001 Nights, The Tale of Genji, Don Quixote, The Communist Manifesto, now how did that come in? And Harry Potter. So what is it that binds this idea together? You know, I think I wrote the book very much because of what we are talking about, namely the idea of making a case for the humanities. Instead of writing another manifesto for the humanities or complaining, oh, why, why no one cares about the humanities anymore, I thought I wanted to take a different approach, namely to really show the force of literature, and I, in order to show the force of literature, I felt I needed to go beyond, I think a lot of people when they hear literature, they think of the fiction bookshelf in a bookstore, right? Yep. And what could be 
less important than that in some sense. So I thought, okay, I need to expand the concept of literature and really include and, and expand it to include written, important written stories. And that led me to think about the f earliest foundational texts, foundational epics, of which, of course, India has such wonderful examples, to look at religious sacred texts that are also written stories, to look at politi foundational political texts like the Declaration of Independence or the Communist Manifesto that derive their importance and their worldwide influence because, in part, they tell stories. So it was an, uh, an attempt to, to rethink literature through this concept of influential written stories and therefore demonstrate really the shaping power of storytelling. And I feel like this is something that the humanities are good at to analyze written stories, but we tend not to do it because humanities research, to come back to the earliest uh, comments, tend to be so specialized that I think we sometimes lose track of, of the big picture. And I think the true influence of storytelling, for example, really emerges once you take this bird's eye view that I tried to take in the book, look at 4,000 years of history and think about the shaping power of, of written texts. So it was an, I think it was an attempt to make an argument for the humanities without writing a manifesto, but by sort of showing it in action, if you will. So we are again talking about the practical expression of uh, education curriculum. Um, back to Dipankar, you've heard the other two panelists. If you'd like to comment on any aspect that's been raised. Yeah, I think I've, I've learned a lot from my fellow panelists, and I'm grateful to you. And I think it's uh, necessary for me to clarify a few issues. The first one being that we shouldn't force humanities down the throats of scientists. We should let concerns of humanity emerge from research. Let me tell you how I've seen, I've envisaged the whole thing. If you have a society where you consider the poor to be part of you and not an other sitting out there, then the kind of research you'll do will naturally involve them. But some scientists balk at that suggestion because they want to link themselves to other scientists across the world. In my view, if you do research where the poor are directly affected, it's going to be high research. It's not going to be low research. It never can be. And I think that that is a problem that people have. They feel that if they do relevant studies and relevant research, it's going to be second grade science. Whereas I think it's going to be first rate science because there's, that's where the challenge lies. In fact, if you look at the recent report set out by ACER, the, the, what's it, ASER, the Annual Survey of Education uh, Review. Review. Yeah, there you'll find that um, the math and reading skills of children is sadly going down. But what you see side by side is the paradoxical fact that enrollment in schools and higher institutions is going up. And that's what's interesting. It basically means that ch children in India want to learn. You're not giving them enough education, but that's not for want of trying. They're trying very hard to be educated. You are just not providing it, which is why I say that the government must step in and make sure that universal education is provided and not take refuge under the slogan that we don't have enough money. If you look at, you asked about Harvard. You know, if you look at the Nobel Prize winners, you will find that about 65% of them did their Nobel Prize work before they went to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, etc. That is, their Nobel Prize work was done in universities which are not Ivy League universities. If you look at the last five years, you'll find that 60% of Nobel Prize winners in science were not from, were, were born outside America. So some of the basic education was outside the Ivy League. In other words, we need to have good education across the board and not just in Ivy Leagues. That's the big problem. In India today, we keep talking about uni of institutions of excellence, forgetting the groundwork. You cannot have a good education system which doesn't move from the basic right to the top. I've heard it said so often that we must have good primary education. What for? 
If after primary education you have bad secondary education, even worse, higher secondary education, and a dreadful university education, then why should primary education be of any use? It has to be the full circle, like health. You uh, save a child from dysentery or diarrhea so that he dies 10 years later of appendicitis. What sense does it make? Health and education are in the round. They're complete projects. You can't break them up into little pieces. Relevant education, certainly. Relevant research, certainly. But that relevant research, if you're really serious about it, will naturally have a humanitarian content. Why do children in India don't want to go for vocational studies? Because they feel that, that you're just shunting them away in a direction which middle class people don't want to go to. You're kind of making them feel inferior. And so they resist. For example, the same ASA support says, report says that 5% of kids will go in for uh, vocational schools, whereas the number of graduates or those who enroll for graduate for BA, BSc, BCom is 12%, and it might double in the next 20 years. Why is this so? In, 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 in England, in the late 19th century, the working class of England said, we don't want to send our children to vocational schools. We want our children to get the luxury the word I'm, I'm emphasizing, the luxury of education. We want them to go to, B for, to Oxford and Cambridge. Of course, they couldn't get in there. Some university, like the University of Reading in England, came up on account of this uh, desire amongst the working class for the luxury of education. So let's not put the working class into vocational studies. Let's think that's the largest scheme of things. Education should be from the base right to the top. And when you do that and you encourage research, humanities will definitely come in. You don't have to muscle, it doesn't have to muscle its way in. So I'm going to pick up uh, some phrases from what uh, Dipankar said about uh, relevant education and turn to Matt Reed. If education is culturally relevant, and the Aga Khan Foundation works in so many countries. You could perhaps give us an example of any of the education initiatives. When we are talking about culturally relevant education for a particular group, are we not isolating them from a kind of a world-class education? Or how does one find that middle path between culturally relevant education and a kind of global high quality, because one of the things that is missing from a lot of our education agenda worldwide is the quality. And it's only the top-rung people in the top-rung schools and even then the top-rung departments that seem to get the quality. So I agree with all of you that education is in a crisis, but how do we meet this kind of uh, fine balance? I mean, it's a fair point, uh, and, and, and uh, let, let me clarify in that regard, because when, I, when we're talking about locally relevant, locally adapted education, I absolutely do not mean parochial. I do not mean only in dialogue with itself. I mean, what we're trying to do in these universities uh, is build world-class universities, researchers who are in dialogue with colleagues in other countries around topics of general concern, but that have a specific applicability in the places where they live. So let me give you an example. Um, we have a, a, a person who works for Aga Khan University, his name is Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta, who is a world-renowned expert on nutrition. Now, uh, he is based in Pakistan, in Karachi. Um, Pakistan, very much like India, actually, has a huge problem of undernutrition and malnutrition, uh, and the statistics are actually very, very similar. You know, something like 50% uh, of children are malnourished. Uh, something like a similar number are stunted, right? And so you have similar levels uh, in both of these places. Now, what Zulfikar Bhutta has done is a set of research in slum areas, in rural areas, to understand what are the kinds of interventions that work best. Not only what are the kinds of, let's say, culturally relevant interventions, how do you get people to eat right, etc., but also uh, can you make significant differences by incorporating micronutrients? What would those micronutrients be, etc.? Now that is research that now is funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, and the idea is that that research will in fact inform nutrition policy around the world. So he's on 
uh, advisory panels at the WHO, et cetera. So the idea is that he's actually, I mean, in a way you could think of it as, as going in both directions. So he's taking research that's highly relevant to a crisis in Pakistan that also has global relevance and working between those two worlds. And I think that when you talk about emphasizing high quality inquiry, that's really what you want. You want to sort of enable those researchers at your institutions who can uh, sort of go between those two worlds. I absolutely would not want anyone here to come away with the idea that we think that uh, 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 university education or universities are only relevant when they're focused on local problems. They should actually be able to be focused on both. And I think that comes back to something that Martin was saying, I mean, for me, and this in a way is the value of the humanities, if you will, as a kind of base. Not that the sciences should all of a sudden all start reading poetry, but actually scientists and poets have to come away with a certain set of intellectual adaptability, a kind of intellectual curiosity that allows them precisely to be um, relevant in local and global contexts. Can I just say a word here? Please. Uh, you know, I'm very happy you raised the question of scientists and poets. Uh, the, the discussion between Rabindranath Tagore and Einstein mm. is absolutely seminal. Yeah. And the fact that they did communicate to each other and very meaningfully was that both of them had similar ideals. Yeah. So those ideals matter. And you have to be, if you have a scientist with ideals, then that does a lot more for science than a scientist who knows sociology. Yeah. And yeah. it's that focus on quality, right? I mean, that's the thing. Really wanting to absolutely do, push yourself to do the best in whatever your field is. And I think that's something to come back to what you were talking about, is that oftentimes uh, is lacking even in our expectations about uh, the general True. education system. Too often we say, well, it's rights-based, we've got it, it's there, it's fine. They have access to something. But the question ought to be, is it good? Is it good enough and how to make it better? Okay. So um, Martin, from this discussion, are we moving into a suggestion that interdisciplinary platforms um, are valuable? That's the direction to go to? You mentioned that the technology students can take to the theater and the performing arts. Would the reverse happen? Would the humanities students go into science courses? I mean, quite often that reverse journey becomes difficult. And whereas the science, the IIT, the IIM, we see that here too. They take to poetry, art, fiction, theater, etc. But how many students from the humanities um, would then take to yeah. particle physics, for instance. Yeah. So um, I'd be happy if you were to respond to yeah. either this or some of the issues raised by our panelists. Yeah, um, I, I can speak to this and I then I want to ask a question uh, of my co-panelists, but to the back and forth, the traffic between the science and art students, I think there is one thing really to be said in favor of the American educational system, and that's the liberal arts, the American style liberal arts education, where none of the students who enter college in America are specialized on one track. They come in, and for about two years, they just do general education. And that means that they have to take science, they have to do engineering, they have to do the social studies, and they have to do arts and humanities. And only then do they specialize in in one area, but even then, up through their last year in college, in this four-year college course, do they have, they still have to take these distribution requirements. It's very hard to make an argument with, for, for that, because it of course means that students don't come out of this university system with a very specialized knowledge, um, but it has that immense advantage that for at least two years, the students, they take, take classes in all of these areas. So it's much, so every class I've taught uh, had students from all of, all of these areas. And it's a chaotic system, if you will. It's unstructured. But out of this chaos emerges maybe something that we now suddenly need and need to replicate in university systems, which are most of university systems around the world, that start in a much more specialized manner from, from the beginning. So, so, so that would mm. be, it has to do weirdly with a lack of structure mm. of, of the American college. Uh, and it's very hard to convince, I think, other you know, university administrators to undo structures. 
because they want to create structures. And you have to say, do less. And that allows for more fluidity in some ways. True. You had a question for one of the well, panelists. Well, you know, I feel like since we're talking about education and development, um, I was wondering what both of you, or all three of you, think about online education, MOOCs, right? Massive open online courses. I've been involved in one. And I think there was a time when MOOCs emerged about five years ago when people either thought it was going to be the solution to everything or that it was going to destroy everything. I think we are now at a point where it's clear that neither of these two extremes have happened. But I think it is uh, uh, an interesting tool. They are, of course, very expensive to produce. So there, there are huge international inequities, in some sense, in the production of these courses. But they, you know, allow, they're, they're free. My course on world literature, people from 155 countries participate in it. It's absolutely free. And is that something that, for example, the Aga Khan University, do you incorporate that into your syllabi? Do you think that that's something that is going to play a role in, in the future or even now? Well, yes, uh, but uh, let me get to the first question that you raised about interdisciplinary uh, studies. You said that in American uh, liberal arts, the, there's a lack of structure. I think there is, in fact, a great degree of structure in the lack of structure. <laughs> because what they really do is to allow students to look around, yeah. to shop around, see right. where they're, what they're good at. But at no point, whether a student is being taught history or science or physics or optics, at no point is the course compromised for the sake of interdisciplinary research, never. So the courses are given in pure form, and you are allowed to choose. Mm -hmm. And I think for that to happen, you need to have a lot of structure, a lot of back, you know, backroom sure. work. Yes. You have deans sure. who would do just this work and nothing yeah. else. Sure. So I would, sure. uh, I would contest yeah. your notion yeah, yeah, yeah. that there's a lack of structure. I think there's a lot of structure. In, when it comes to uh, education um, uh, on, on the wire, I uh, feel that if you're going to get quality education across, I don't care how it comes. Mm -hmm. My idea is to get the end result. I don't want to get stuck in the details mm -hmm. of how you go about it. Mm -hmm. If it, at times this kind of education through the net is useful, go ahead. A friend of mine tells me, and he should know, he's my friend, he tells me that <laughs> after all, if there's a tussle between human beings and machine, trust the machine. <laughs> well, that's the subject of another panel going on right now on uh, AI and alternative intelligence and jobs, which we can talk about in a second. Mm. But I mean, I, I think that uh, just to, 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 to come back a bit to your point on blended, or, or, I guess on MOOCs, I mean, our experience actually has been uh, much more successful around blended learning. Yeah. So yeah. The, the MOOC experiment, for those of you who don't know, massive online courses, it's a very actually passive, uh, in a way, yeah. uh, can be. Yes. Passive experience where you're there, you can tap into a course, but there's very little, or can be, in some instances, very little interaction. Sure. There's very little on-site education that's happening. And so I guess, uh, in that sense, our experience is a bit like Dupunker was saying, which is that uh, it's context-specific, it, it matters very much how it's done. Yeah. And there are instances where it can be done well. Our experience has been that it, it, it works best when it's yeah. uh, in a flipped yeah. classroom context. Yeah. So in other words, um, you may have, say, lectures or other materials that are done on video uh, that can come from outside or mm -hmm. inside, if you will, but that are then matched with somebody uh, in the room, if you will, yeah. or, or, or in the, the space working with people and helping them understand, problem solve, et cetera, so that they actually are able to apply the learning to real world problems, if you will. We can talk about that yeah. a bit more. But. Um, yes, I will come into this because uh, while MOOCs offers a huge opportunity for mass outreach of education, um, and having taught at a very large university such as Delhi for many, many years, I worry about the language because MOOCs are predominantly available in English. And you also need access to high technology in order to have efficient delivery system of the MOOCs. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you're not going to create another kind of a divide, sure. that those who know English yeah. and can access technology will be able to benefit by the MOOCs that are available yeah. for free, provided you have this base. Right. 
What happens to the thousands of students who want another language, who do not have even a basic computer? Yeah. So where is this, this uh, idea of equitable wow. education yes. going to lead us to if digital learning becomes the majority uh, way or the majority yeah. method yeah. of uh, going across, yeah. particularly higher education? Right. Is it only going to be once again the language of the colonizers? Yeah. But um, one, one last round maybe and then we'll take questions from the floor. Um, so maybe from each of you, some response to the discussion. Well, as I said earlier, from my point of view, I'd like to see the result. And if the result isn't good, I don't care what kind of wanted technology you're using. Uh, digital learning, for me, as far as I'm concerned, is a very good idea. If you cannot translate books into regional languages, then you cannot translate stuff in digital either. The fact of the matter is that you have failed on the first count. You haven't made enough effort to translate languages, the books into languages that are spoken in the country. Number two, I must also say from my own experience, people when they learn English, they don't always learn English as a cultural acquisition. They often learn English as a technical necessity. And I don't see why we cannot teach English as a technical necessity to most people. And it's done rather well for a number of years. For my, my parents' generation, for example, they spoke their mother tongue at home, but they spoke equally good English outside. And why was that so? Because they were taught English as a technical language. And so what the mistake we make is that we get all wrapped up in cultural aspects. That's, that's I think, a very important thing. Mm -hmm. So you can impart digital uh, knowledge, especially when you do not have quality teachers. When you do not have quality teachers, digital inf information, digital technology is a good idea because then you can impart good lectures digitally and good information digitally, which is otherwise not be possible. I would say that the two should combine because nowhere will you have a mix of teachers who are the best. But if you take the entire world as your village, then you can source teachers from anywhere and add to the fund of knowledge. I mean, just to stay on this issue of online and equitable access, because I think it's a good, I think it's a good question, but you know, one of the things that we've tried to do at Agra Khan University um, is to uh, work, so for example, uh, we are using online education to train nurses and doctors in remote parts of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you couldn't think of a more resource constrained environment than remote Afghanistan. What we've done is on the, let's say the receiving end, so that is in those communities, um, these online courses are not received by individuals on their laptops. You actually can create a kind of community education center, you get them linked up, so you can have a kind of public investment actually in that access, uh, so that it's not just about are you accessing it on your phone or your tablet, which then is actually frankly very limited to a certain economic, uh, socioeconomic class if you will. But what we've tried to do is say, well, actually, these are tools. And the tools can be used in any way that you want them. As long as you're sensitive to the issue of access, you can find ways around it. The question is, how then do you find high quality content that's relevant and get it to them? So that's one thing that, 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 that we've done in that issue. If I just very quickly on the issue of interdisciplinarity, I wanted to say a little, I mean, I see a lot of young people in the audience and maybe a few parents who are probably thinking about either are they studying the right thing at university or what should they be doing or what should their kids be doing. And I had an interesting conversation with somebody just now, um, uh, a young woman who had actually got a degree in art history uh, or art design, excuse me, um, and now she's a software engineer, not actually in animation, doing something totally different. Uh, and I said to her, well, how did you end up doing that? And she said, well, you know, the things that I learned in the art design course had to do with working in teams, uh, organ organizing my time, critical thinking, all those sorts of things that yeah. we expect to talk about when we talk about um, the arts and the humanities. Um, and she said to me, you know, on the other hand, I realize that this is a luxury. Uh, I went to a very good school and not everyone has the luxury of that kind of an education. And my thinking is actually different, which is that actually everybody should take that luxury. Because actually, uh, in fact, to come to your point, it's the folks who are in the most circumscribed circumstances, if you will, 
who need to be the most adaptable, to take advantage of whatever opportunity happens to come their way. So it may be that she had a certain degree of choice in what she decided to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I don't think that, that that education is any less relevant for somebody because they come from a marginalized community than because they come from a privileged community. Well, we've had a lot of ideas here, thought, analysis. We have a few minutes to take some quick questions, focused questions about what the panelists say, and please mention who you want that to be responded to. Very brief, so we can get lots of voices in. Yes, please, let's start with you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Akriti Bhatia, and uh, my question and concern is with respect to the disconnect and the lack of openness within university spaces and surprisingly within uh, humanities and social sciences as well. So, uh, for example, giving my own example, um, I am in the department of sociology, but my work is on uh, uh, informal economy and labor and often I have been asked, why are you doing this kind of work uh, uh, from like a sociological point of view? Um, or my engagements, for example, uh, with the working with members of parliament, and also an entrepreneurial, uh, you know, That's project uh, with uh, actually, you know, um, so, so just one moment. It's not very well one, received. One second, so, I have to just yeah. interrupt a little bit. What is your question? Yes, so I, I want to know that uh, we, we talk about uh, openness and uh, interdisciplinariness. So how how to actually have that kind of a, uh, a well received attitude towards actual interdisciplinariness, and how do we bridge the gap between the policy public? and academia. Particularly in relation to sociology? Uh, in relation to academia, because uh, just okay. last point, because no, no, scholars... No, no, no more. Sorry, there are lots of Thank hands you. there. Well, you see, uh, you talked about informal labor and people are getting a little worked up and antsy about the fact that there's no connection with sociology. Let me tell you, I've spent the last 10 years of my life doing informal labor, studying right. informal <laughs> labor. And let me also tell you, it's rich with sociological uh, uh, theory. For example, if you look at the Indian context, the, so the sociology of social mobility, the sociology of emulation, the sociology of agriculture, moving from agriculture to industry, small-scale industry, and the sociology of migration. In fact, I can't think of a, be a better area where sociology is more relevant. So I don't think that is a point, the problem. The problem is that we should step away from traditional areas and look at those which we think are interesting because everything that you think is interesting, believe me, is relevant for science. You cannot think of something interesting which is irrelevant. It cannot be. And therefore, I would say to you that you just look into your sociological literature, look into whatever is your basic disciplines. You will find a whole lot in there. It's good to distribute the question. So the next question could probably be for Martin or for Matt, please specify very briefly. Yes, uh, my question is, and uh, this is related to uh, all of you, but also uh, to you and uh, Professor Gupta. Uh, it takes a long time for young people to figure out what is their true calling, passion. Yes. You know, even uh, many, many years yes. until they find out that this is my real interest. Yes. And, in India and also, as you said, in America, there's a lot of pressure on young people from the parents, from the society, to go for IT, business studies, and so on. These are the two main areas. But, but uh, there, there are organizations, like in Harvard universities. So maybe please have a question. Yes. I'm a direct question that can be answered. Yes. So how can we help young people to find their true interest and okay. also, how can we, f just related question, no, no, just a question. I, we, we, no, we have no more time. I'm so okay. sorry. He'll take that question. Thank you so much, please. Thank you for this question. And I think the way you formulated this problem resonates a lot with me. On the one hand, I feel like often, if you're 18 or 19, you don't know yourself yet. So how do you know what you want to do? So I think university systems should become more flexible and allow people in their mid-20s or early 30s or late 30s to return to university to change their, their studies. Maybe they have some work experience. So the whole area of what in the US is called adult education, I think, especially for the humanities, um, really important. And I think that the distinction between a university system that forces students to become students 
in the ages of 17 to 21 or 22 is in some ways too inflexible to, I think, accommodate that. So I, I agree, it's, it's sometimes too early for students to, to really know. Um, can we have a question for Matt Reed, please? Somebody who has that focus. You, you could we raise your hand for a lot. It's good, right? it's a good idea to get many voices in. Please, he's been raising his hand for a while. Hello, my name is Akshay Santhalia. And my question is, it could be applied to all of you, but even you can answer the question. It's, do you think the uncertainty and the lack of vision to deliver compelling consequences for pass out, that is students, in education institutions give a rise to homeschooling and self-schooling? Self-schooling, so what's the question? Will the uncertainties and the lack of vision in education institutions give a rise to homeschooling Oh. And so we'll self-schooling. Huh. So self self-schooling and homeschooling. The lack of direction in education will it lead to self-schooling? I mean, I, I, that's not a question I'm really qualified to answer. Uh, whether it, it should be, I mean, I, I think it comes back. Uh, 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 self-schooling might be a separate issue. Uh, I, I have a hard time imagining how self-schooling would work. Homeschooling uh, at, at a certain age. Uh, it might work later. Homeschooling, uh, I get. There are arguments for doing it. I guess what I would say is that from us, from a kind of policy perspective, I think that there ought to be room w in whatever country we're talking about for a variety of educational experiments to address these issues and that we can be a bit platform agnostic about what those things are. And so in our instance, that's why we want, that's why we're working on uh, private university education there's a space for public university education, uh, et cetera. And then what we actually just need is much more innovation around the models for delivering high quality education. So that, that would be my reaction to that. One last question, please. Somebody here, there's a, I want, uh, are you from a school, from an institution? Where are you from? I'm from uh, tw class 12th. Class 12th, go ahead. Uh, I'm having a question for Mr. Dipanka Gupta that you had said uh, uh, earlier that Indian government should introduce a policy on education. So what should be the main points of, uh, in that uh, policy according to you? That's my question. Oh yeah, the main points, number one, the distinction between private schools and public schools should be abolished. In fact, if that happens, I can guarantee you that those who go in for private education will get a better education. We get a poor private education because the public education system is so bad. That is the first thing we should take care of. We have to have universal education, point one. Number two, teachers should be well paid and they should actually be prized as you know, those who are contributing to social development and social welfare. Number three, as he said, you should be open enough to choose what you want. You know, you talked about poetry. I don't know, you talked about poetry. I mentioned Tagore and Einstein. What I forgot to mention was that in America, the chairman of the Center for Disease Control, which is a very, very large and most prestigious institution, he did a PhD in literature. At the age of 30, he said, no, I want to do it in medicine. And did a PhD in medicine, look where he's got. So don't you worry, you can change track anytime. Well, on, on that happy note, we will have to end the session. We're running out of time. I can see lots of eager hands, bright eyes, especially the young people. I'm sure there is conversation to be held outside the arena of the state. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. For the